few musicians can lay claim to having a hand in the production, composition, and performing of an entire musical genre. The player we will examine today is one of those few. Given the keys to the legendary Stax Records, a stable of artists, he would shape the sound of every recording released from that label for a solid decade. Soul Man, Time is Tight, Green Onions, all these riffs were written and performed by the same man, a man whose career has spanned into eight decades and has seen him perform on literally hundreds of songs by almost as many artists, as well as some of his own. And would you believe that the man playing guitar on all these great records by amazing black soul artists was a young, skinny, white farm boy from Missouri? Today, we're going to look at none other than the Colonel, Steve Cropper, next on Forgotten Fretmasters. Hello friends and welcome once again to Forgotten Fretmasters, the documentary series where we examine guitarists or musicians who for one reason or another might not have been as commercially successful as, had the longevity of, or just left us sooner than some of the other guys who often end up on all the top 10 lists. But before we get into it, please make sure you subscribe to the channel for more rock history content like this and hit the bell icon to get notified whenever we post new content. A lot of my subscribers have recently been telling me that they've been having trouble seeing my newer videos, so turning on notifications will make sure you don't miss a thing. Now, let's take a look at an absolute legend who supported almost too many artists to mention, but we're going to try to get to most of them. Stephen Lee Cropper was born, as we said, on a farm near Willow Springs, Missouri on October 21st, 1941. In his early life, Steve's musical upbringing saw him fed a steady diet of country music, but when he was nine, he and his family would move to Memphis, Tennessee, which is where the real musical education would begin. Steve said that when he was first exposed to black church music that his mind was blown, and aside from that, the Memphis music scene was a perfect amalgamation of white country tones and black R&B. The legendary Sun Studio in Memphis that borne such early blues and birth of rock acts through the 1950s, like Johnny Cash, Helen Wolf, Carl Perkins, B.B. King, Jerry Lee Lewis, Roy Orbison, and of course Elvis thrilled the young cropper and music had him under his spell from his early teen years. So when he was 14, he would order his first guitar by mail. Surprisingly, even though Cropper had his pick of the litter of early guitar gods, it would be a lesser known R&B guitarist named Lowman Pauling of the Five Royales that he would model his playing style after. Pauling's songs like Dedicated to the One I Love and Think would be covered throughout the 60s by many artists, but more importantly, his economy of style taught Steve his most valuable lesson, that less is more. As Cropper worked on his craft over the next few years, he made sure to resist the urge to overplay, and this would shape his playing style over his entire career, as we would soon find out. By the time Steve was 18 and still in high school, he found himself in his first professional outfit in 1958 an R&B combo called the Royal Spades, which tried unsuccessfully to get a record made with Satellite Records. The tenor sax player in the group, Packy Axton, was the son of Estelle Axton and the nephew of Jim Stewart, who would eventually go on to form Stax Records, and Estelle would convince the group to change their name after finally getting to record their first single, the ubiquitous late 50s anthem, Last Night. There's a link to the original recording in the description, I guarantee you've heard it before. Anyway, they would change their name to the Marquees after the large marquee sign outside of the recording studio that would soon house Stax Records, formerly the Capitol Movie Theater. It was around this time that Cropper would upgrade his gear with the guitar that he would arguably become best known for. He acquired a used Fender Esquire, probably in 1954. This would be the guitar that he would use on the early Stax recordings, but a little more on that later. Last Night would end up becoming a smash hit in the U.S., rising to number three in the charts and selling over a million copies. Strangely, though, Steve didn't play guitar on it. He ended up playing second piano on the track, as the producer felt that there was no place for a guitar on it. The band tried unsuccessfully to capture the spirit of the song again to little success, but more importantly, Cropper himself came under the scrutiny of Satellite Records president Stewart. Stewart saw something in the skinny farm boy, a professionalism and no-nonsense approach that set him apart from even some of the older musicians that he dealt with. The Marquees, although the lineup would change many times, would become the house band on many early recordings on Satellite Records, a harbinger of what was to come. 
Soon, Stewart found his little record label growing, and he would soon rename the label to Stax, and with its growth, he began to give Cropper more responsibility. Most record label heads wouldn't dream of handing the keys to the kingdom to a mere 21-year-old musician with little experience, but that's exactly what he did. Cropper was tasked with heading up Stax's a and department in 1961 and building the label's new house band. Then 17-year-old musician Booker T. Jones joined Stax mostly as a Hammond organ player, and the next year, he and Cropper would solidify the Stax house band along with Louis Steinberg on bass and Al Jackson Jr. on drums to become Booker T. and the MGs. The MGs would also record in their own right, most famously releasing the iconic instrumental Green Onions in 1962. That was one of the first songs to feature Cropper's staggering cutting tone and economy of style. Guitar players everywhere took notice of Cropper's way of playing in the pocket with the rest of the band, and most importantly, not overplaying. But when he did play, you sure heard it. Booker T and the MGs went on to record on most Stax recordings between 1962 and 1970, working with all Stax artists on such legendary hit records like Otis Redding's Just One More Day and Sitting on Dock of the Bay, Wilson Pickett's In the Midnight Hour, Chicken Scratch with Rufus Thomas, and most importantly, Soul Man by Sam and Dave. In the end, Cropper would co-write, produce, and perform on hundreds of singles out of Stax throughout the decade of the 1960s. Stax would begin to market themselves as a more authentic soul label than their rivals to the north at Motown, but for music fans all over the world, there was no reason to favor one over the other, considering both labels put out such amazing music. One such act that eyed Stax and particularly Steve style with amazement and reverence was a little Liverpool, England outfit that you may have heard of called the Beatles, and this respect went so far as to see John and Paul try to snag some recording time in the studio with Steve in 1965 during one of the band's U.S. tours, but in the end, Beatles manager Brian Epstein would shut the meeting down, citing concerns for the Fab Four's safety. Imagine a Beatles single produced by Cropper with maybe even an appearance by the guitarist on the record? Well, that would have been something. But Steve, the MGs, and Stax just kept rolling along through the decade, cementing themselves as the top soul music record label of all time, continuing to pump out hit after hit by their stable of amazing talent. In 1965, Louis Steinberg would be replaced by legendary bass player Donald Duck Dunn, but unfortunately Stax would lose its biggest star, Otis Redding, in a plane crash in 1967 at just 26 years old. Later that year, his biggest hit, Sitting on the Dock of the Bay, would be released posthumously and be co-written by Cropper. The later part of the 60s saw the MGs have a drop in chart success in their own right until the release of top 40 hit Hip Hugger, which returned the band to the national interest. Other moments from the late 60s included a European tour called the Stax Volt Review, which saw the MGs backing most of the bands and also playing in their own right. The band would also appear at the Monterey Pop Festival in the June of 67, and would also back Otis Redding at the festival. They were invited to play at Woodstock in 1969, but drummer Al Jackson Jr. was worried about getting into the helicopter needed to take them to the gig, so the band decided not to play. In 1969, the MGs would have a number six hit with Time is Tight, another instrumental tune that no one knows that they know, but they just know. <laughs> Several new acts would be introduced by Stax in the late 60s, notably including Delaney and Bonnie, who would leave Stax shortly thereafter, taking several session musicians like Bobby Whitlock with them. You can find out more about all that in my Bobby Whitlock video right up here. 1969 also saw Cropper taking a turn as an artist in his own right, releasing his first solo album called With a Little Help From My Friends. The all-instrumental album featured reworkings of both his own and other artist standards and was met with delight and admiration from his fellow artists, but not much by way of album sales. Still, the album is a great listen even today, with particular performances on 99 and a Half Won't Do and Rattlesnake standing out for me. In 1970, after a mutual admiration between Booker T and the MGs and the Beatles, the band released the album Macklemore Avenue, which was a send-up of the Beatles' Abbey Road album, with the cover photo having the band crossing the road outside of Stax Records and featuring most of the songs from Abbey Road reworked by the MGs into medleys. This admiration went far back with John Lennon even colloquially calling the band Book a Table in the Mater D's. <laughs> Much of Paul McCartney's bass playing later in the Beatles' career was also influenced by Dunn's melodic grooves. As the calendar turned to the 1970s, changes at Stax were beginning to weigh on some of the talent. Al Bell, who had joined Stax in 1965 as a promotional director, had swiftly charged up the ranks to eventually become a vice president, second only to co-owner and founder Jim Stewart. 
Bell had a different vision for Stacks, as he believed that the sales market was moving more towards album sales and less in singles releases. He began to push the talent to produce more content, to fill quality albums, and not everyone at the label was on board. By 1971, Booker T left Stax Records and moved to Los Angeles. Steve Cropper was also not happy about the changes and would follow Jones out the door later that year, opening his own Memphis studio that he called TMI Studios. For Steve Cropper, this began a period where the main hat he wore was that of producer, and Steve would helm projects by a diverse cast of musicians such as Tower of Power, Rod Stewart, John Prine, Jose Feliciano, the Jeff Beck Group, Ringo Starr, and even John Lennon, finally working with John on his rock and roll album in 1975. Around that same year, Cropper also moved to LA and would eventually meet back with Booker T and Dunn and Jackson in hopes of reforming the old band. They decided to give each other a few months to finish up their respective projects to then reform as Booker T. Jones and the Memphis Group. However, tragedy would strike only 10 days later as Al Jackson Jr., whom Steve called the greatest drummer to ever walk the earth, was murdered in his home on October 1st, 1975. The murder would take the wind out of the band's sails, and the reunion didn't take place in the same way that they had hoped. They would eventually record a 1977 effort called Universal Language with Asylum Records, drafting Stack session drummer Willie Hall, more on him later, to fill the drum throne, but the album wasn't successful to their standards, and over the next few years, appearances would be sparse. Steve would also collaborate with legendary the band drummer Levon Helm for a couple albums in the late 70s, with the band known as Levon Helm and his RCO All-Stars. But a public rediscovery of some of MG's and Stack's greatest hits would come from an unlikely place in the late 70s with the formation of the Blues Brothers Band, which was born from the minds of Saturday Night Live cast members John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd. Over the course of a couple of years after 1976, beginning with a skit from SNL with, which featured Belushi singing I'm a King Bee with Aykroyd on harmonica, John's fascination with the blues became an obsession and this culminated in the formation of a real blues band in 1978. Joining the group was a star-studded cast of characters. Cropper and Dunn from the MGs, Horns Blue Lou Marini and Tom Malone, formerly of Blood, Sweat and Tears, Juilliard-trained trumpeter Alan Rubin was brought in, as was blues guitarist Matt Guitar Murphy, and Willie Hall, mentioned above as the stack session drummer, was brought in on the skins. This led to an actual album being released in 1978 called Briefcase Full of Blues, which featured arguably Steve Cropper's most famous licks from the Sam and Dave tune Soul Man. All of these players would feature prominently in the classic all-time 1980 comedy The Blues Brothers, which happens to be one of my all-time favorite movies, with hilarious turns especially from Alan Rubin as the Mater D at the Shea Paul and Willie Hall famously asking Joliet Jake, You got the money, you owe us, mother The film features many cropper pen tunes and some of his most famous guitar riffs, including Time is Tight, and The Blues Brothers' hilarious turn was a smash hit culminating in many reunion shows over the years, even after the untimely death of Belushi in 1982. Many other guest vocalists would step into John's shoes over the years, including his brother Jim and actor John Goodman. Cropper would release another solo turn called Playing My Thang in 1981, which ended up being a strange addition to his catalog with Steve taking a stab at lead vocals to um, decidedly mixed results and unfortunately notedly lackluster guitar playing. This was followed up by 1982's Night After Night, which again was an unsuccessful and mostly unregarded album. Over the years, Cropper has collaborated, produced, and played on metric tons of amazing artist albums and projects, including Rod Stewart, Albert King, Richie Havens, Ringo Starr, Felix Cavallari, Delaney and Bonnie, Leon Russell, Peter Frampton, Art Garfunkel, Mavis Staples, Mickey Thomas, Roy Orbison, Al Cooper, Harry Nilsson, Etta James, John Prine, Jimmy Buffett, and Paul Simon. Nowadays, Cropper is known to have ditched the Fender Tellies for his own line of signature PV guitars. Hey Fender, if you're listening, make a damn Cropper signature Esquire, would you? Come on, man. As a result, Cropper's recording career over the 80s and 90s and beyond slowed down quite a bit with only a few full-length albums being released to his name, with Cropper playing in a lot of tribute and reunion shows over the years, cementing his status as a premier guitarist of the 1960s. Cropper reunited with the MGs to release That's the Way It Should Be in 1994, 
Notable tours and collaborations that Steve has done recently include 2011's dedicated tribute to the Five Royales, the band that set Steve's entire career in motion with the guitar sound of Low Man Pauling, a 2017 turn reuniting the Blues Brothers band, and finally, in the year 2021, that's this year, Steve emerged with yet another album that blows the doors off his career with a surprising return to form, featuring some awesome guitar playing over some unused soul-drenched tunes that were harvested from Cropper's long career at Stax and his two collaborations with Felix Cavalieri of the Rascals. This new album is proof positive that you can never take the soul out of the man, and Steve Cropper has proven this again and again over the years, using his signature cutting twang and catchy, memorable riffs to add color to some of the most famous and timeless songs ever recorded. The Colonel will be celebrating his 80th birthday this October, and watching him live even today shows that he hasn't lost any love for those amazing Stax tunes that he helped shape back in his 20s. Here's to another 80 years of one of the most unsung heroes of the guitar. In an era when most players went louder and faster, Steve Cropper proved that it's not always the loudest and fastest voice that gets heard. That's another episode of Forgotten Fretmasters. Remember to please subscribe to the channel for dozens more music history videos just like this and hit the bell icon to get notified whenever we post new content. YouTube has been kicking my channel to the curb, so if you want me to be able to continue doing what I do, help me out by subbing and liking the video. Thanks so much for watching and we will see you next time on the Guitar Historian channel.